Welcome to our series, Real Terms for AI, where we're gonna be talking about generative AI, but as the rest of us developers know it, not just the LLM researchers. My name is Aja Hammerly, and for this series, I'm gonna be joined by Jason Davenport. So Jason, we know the most important step of generative AI is actually picking a good use case for AI. What can you start telling us here? Well, I think most people think of generative AI as this highly complex thing but it can allegedly solve all the use cases that are out there, right? And we know that that's not true. But we do know that most use cases of generative AI typically come down to a couple different sets of scenarios. First one, search, just like Google search, where we need to scan tons of information and provide accurate, concise information back to a user. Summarization and question and answer, where we're asking a model to take a lot of inputs and to provide things like the key points, maybe entities in our different documents and things like that. Recommenders that can take a lot of inputs and provide the next best action for someone. And also interfaces like chat, where we want to provide a conversational experience to our users. And last, when we talk about agents later, we'll see how these add even more use cases around things like task automation, where we're asking something to take action on our behalf. So let me think for a second. A chat bot for a travel website essentially meets most of those categories, right? It absolutely does. You could also imagine using search for things like big FAQ documents the users have to find needle and haystack information on, or categorization of things like images, which we may pass into recommenders for a next best action. Many of these scenarios work best when we find the business case that fits all these different components together and actually creates value for the end user. Okay, but let's say I have something like a drive-through and my customers are super used to fast responses. If I'm using an LLM in a situation where latency is important, how does that change how I need to think about LLMs? Well, now what's cool is we're starting to think about all the fun considerations, capital F, fun, about using models in these scenarios. The first one you mentioned, which is what is the performance I actually need from one of our large language models is really important. And we usually think about these things in terms of a few different factors. The first one, which is obviously cost, which is how much does it cost for me to actually host or to call my large language model? Second one around quality, which is am I getting the actual results that I expected from my model? Since sometimes we hear about things like hallucinations, which are obviously bad. And then what you mentioned with latency, which is how quickly do I need to actually get a response from my model to return to my user? In most cases, we think that users can't even detect things where the latency is under like 100 milliseconds. But if you have to do other things in addition to the large language model call, this becomes highly important. Okay, this makes sense. If I think about a model like Gemini, there are different variants that I can use based on my cost and quality requirements. However, that doesn't exactly solve the latency problem of my use case. What are my options if I need really low latency? This really isn't too much different than thinking about how we maybe use edge computing in a scenario like this, where we need to locate our compute closer to our users or to our customers. There's a set of considerations here also around data sovereignty and privacy, where we may need to run models at a specific location to be compliant with different country or jurisdictional data laws. In the case of example of low latency, which we're using throughout this video, we may choose to run a smaller LLM at a specific location so we can actually improve our latency to our customer and maybe even improve our cost. Hey, back up. You said something there about a smaller LLM. That's right. Not LLMs are the same size. We should have mentioned that. LLMs are sometimes measured in what we call parameters, which tend to number in the billions or trillions, depending on the model type. These are usually correlated with the overall model size, which is also correlated with the time to compute and sometimes correlated about the quality. Although we can actually specialize models, which we'll talk about later in the series to improve our quality of them. Okay, that makes sense. And here we're essentially trading off parameters to make the models smaller, which could make them faster for our users. But I believe there are other methods you can use to make models smaller and almost as performant from a quality perspective, correct? Yep. And so we actually call that process of learning from a larger model distillation. As example, the Google Gemma 2 models use this process in order to s reduce the size pretty significantly without reducing the quality pretty significantly. That's cool. So let's talk about a few other things I always hear about LLMs. One of them is the dreaded question everyone asks, which is cost. And then there are some other more fun questions about things that models have, not just parameters or quality. Like what can we tell everyone about multimodal models? Well, I'll leave the cost one for you to cover here next, but I'm going to talk about multimodal things, which are the fun ones. 
In this case, multimodal models are just ways that we can use a model and provide any sort of input to it, whether that's text, images, audio, or video, in order to get an output or a response from it. And for some specialized models, we can also get a multimodal output. These models tend to be really good at using things for things like creative idea generation. Another factor here that we want to consider is what the features of the model are that it provides. Some models have additional capabilities for doing things like function calling, where it can give a model a tool and it can use that to get different pieces of information instead of only input text. Multilingual models, where the model has the ability to answer different languages to answer different questions, or differences in the context window of a model, which is how much customized input I can provide to the model in order to help answer my question. These features can materially change how we use a particular model for our use case. And in the case of something like Google Gemini, I can give that over 2 million tokens. And in this case, a token is roughly equivalent to four English letter characters. That is a lot of context and a lot of information to provide. So I guess this means that you got the fun part, so I get to talk about cost. So it's easy to think of models as pay-per-use or request, or you can host your own and you can pay for the compute capacity. In the pay-per-use model, the summation of the number of tokens that you provide as input and the tokens you receive as output together equal how much you will pay based on that specific model's rate table. Pay for capacity, that means that you are paying for the compute and GPUs in order to serve your own model, and you're on your own usually for some level of cost optimization. I think it may look scary at first in the pay for use model, but as models improve, the cost curve continues to go down. I think of these as the best starting point regardless of your use case, because you can make sure your use case actually works for your business before you get into optimization and having to host your own model. I love that, because I also think about model specialties in this. You may use a model to return a set of information to give another model to evaluate, or kind of what we call retrieval augment generation or RAG. And then maybe we use an even different model to actually answer the question based on the prior inputs that we got. It's important here to think of everything that we're doing as a workflow in order to get a quality response back for our user. In many cases, these are actually multiple step calls in order to get that answer back. So I think we talked about this, but I'm summarizing the need to use your own model as really something that comes down to saving money or latency without reducing your quality, right? Or maybe a highly specialized use case that we didn't talk about? Yeah, I'm sure there are great edge case scenarios out there, but I think that's a great starting point. And sometimes, as I think you called this out, we tend to get afraid of the pay-per-use model. But in this case, what we want to do is actually validate our use case and then see if we're going to have the production output that may require us to do something on our own. So let's see all this in action here with a sample called a Gemini, which is Google's first party model. Here, we are in Vertex AI Studio, where we're going to analyze a multimodal input, that is text and video together. We'll set our instructions for the LLM, give it the video, and what we are going to summarize. In this case, our total prompt input is around 70,000 tokens of input. We'll use the Gemini Flash 1.5 model for its speed here, and we'll get a great summary back, all in a matter of seconds. And there it is. We can see the response was streamed back to us, and we could even ask follow-up questions or change our prompt for different output methods. To summarize, it's important to think about your use case and if generative AI is actually a good fit or not, provided you have a potential fit, where and how your model needs to run is an important consideration. You have lots of options and features available to you, and it's best to evaluate a number of options to prove out your use case and your business case for your model. We hope you've enjoyed this introduction to real AI in real terms, and we're just getting started. We'll be talking more about other concepts in generative AI, and hopefully making this space more applicable and accessible to all the devs out there. Happy prompting, all. See you soon.